But this was a different game. You know, you can't really convince someone to buy a house. I mean, they're either going to buy it or not. I was him. I was scared shitless not to work Saturday, Sunday. And one day I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, the deals are going to happen at this point. It's very expensive hiring the wrong person. I need to empower my team to be able to go on listing appointments. All right, guys, we have another edition of the Phone Warriors podcast. And today we have another special guest, DK, Agent DK from Toronto, Canada. Welcome, DK. Thank you for having uh, your presence here on the Fun Warriors podcast today. Thank you very much. I'm actually from Ottawa, Canada, but that's okay. Ottawa. Okay, perfect. Yeah, close enough. Everybody thinks I'm from Toronto. I, I don't blame you. It's fine. I swear. I swear. I, I've heard Mike say like Toronto like, like yes. 15 times. Yeah, he says so, it all the time. He's wrong. <laughs> okay. All right. There we go. It's Got not, it. All right. Perfect. Not, so let me be clear. It's not entirely his fault. I actually am born and raised in Ottawa. I moved to Toronto. And I actually started my career in Toronto. So I did sell real estate there for a year and a half. And then I moved back here 11 years ago. So he's not he's not completely wrong. All right. Perfect, man. Perfect. So, yeah, tell us a little, a little bit about yourself and kind of where you, uh, you like you said, started your career and kind of where you are now. And the uh, yeah, it's a, a little bit more about everything like that. Go ahead. Sounds good. Well, first of all, thanks for having me here, guys. I appreciate um, I just appreciate seeing you guys. and. Um, any way we can contribute and help anybody out there would be great. So thank you. Um, okay. A little bit about me, born and raised, born and raised in Ottawa, Canada from, as we mentioned prior to going live here, immigrant Greek parents. My dad was a cook. My mother was a waitress, you know, humble, humble upbringing for sure. Started selling when I was 18, I was selling consumer electronics, like TVs, home theater, stuff like that. And then did that until I was about 27, 28, took my real estate, uh, moved to Toronto to sell electronics in Toronto, bigger city, and wanted to make more money. Um, Ottawa was not a very sexy city, so I moved to TO, make some more money, maybe meet a nice Greek girl, and um, ended up getting the bug for real estate, got my license at night, so I'd sell during the day, and then I'd do my license online uh, evenings and weekends. Started selling real estate in Toronto, which was tough because I didn't know anybody. I had no database, no family, no friends. And, uh, you know, if anyone's been in this business, you know, it's a very tough racket when you don't know anybody and nobody knows who the hell you are. Uh, did all right. My first year hammered out 11, 11 deals. Um, I was dissatisfied. Didn't make as much as I made in my previous year selling TV. So I was like, shit, do I go back to... You know what I mean? Do I go back to retail? What do I do? At this point, I had met my now wife and we needed the money and I was sending money back home to help my family out. So it was tough. So I made a decision. My phone kept ringing off the hook for back home, Ottawa. And, uh, you know, my family was in the restaurant business. So a lot of Greeks were calling me saying, come sell my restaurant. A lot of my friends that called me from like elementary school, high school and, and university would call me and say, look, come sell my home. Come so I would drive, dude, four and a half hours to Toronto, show a house, drive back to Toronto, sell a condo, drive back to Ottawa. I did that for six months. Came wow. to my, yeah, came to my wife said, "Listen, this isn't working. I'm fucking, I, like, I'm, I'm, I'm stretching myself thin. Can we move to Ottawa? And if I haven't proven myself in one year that it's a good move for our family, we'll move back to Toronto." She's like, "No, nah, I don't know. It's a smaller city. Pretty much everybody on the planet told me it was a stupid idea." Because you're going from a place where the average price was like a million bucks to an average price of 300000 Everyone's like, what are you doing, right? And I said, I just have a feeling it's going to take off. So she she agreed reluctantly, moved here. And that, I mean, that first year was a quantum leap. It went from 80000 GCI to 330000 GCI in my first year in Ottawa. And I just took off like a rocket and we ended up staying. And I'm still here 11 years later. So that's kind of like how it started, if you will. And, and and you would say that when you were in Toronto and not knowing a single soul and you were doing both jobs at the same time, yeah. and you clearly were doing some type of business over there. What yeah. were you specifically doing day in and day out to, let's say, build up that database or build up that confidence to start? Because it seems like people back home knew exactly what you're doing. So yeah. were you reaching out to people that way as well, friends and family? Or, you know, walk us through like, how you got yourself to, from your first deal all the way up to your hundredth deal? That's a good question. So uh, back then there was no Instagram. Uh, there was Facebook. So I used Facebook primarily to stay in touch with my family and friends back home. So they did see that I was selling real estate. 
And they all were happy for me and wanted to support me. And everybody knew I've, I've been selling my whole life. So that was kind of an easy transition for me. Um, so I hadn't met Mike there yet. So I was a closer because remember, I was in retail. So like guy walks in, I could close all day long. I could size up the client, see what they need, assess their needs. And 90% of the time I'd close them. And it's also easier than a house. Like you're selling consumer electronics. If they didn't have the money, I'd sign them up on the credit card, get them to do payments of 50 bucks a month. It wasn't hard for me, but this was a different game. You know, you can't really convince someone to buy a house. I mean, they're either going to buy it or not. So uh, I didn't know anybody. So I, what I did is I'd go up to the top producers in, in the office. I'd say, listen, give me all your crap leads. Give me all the people you don't want to talk to. Let me do all of your open houses. Um, I did four open houses a weekend, guys. Saturday, 11 to 1 and 2 to 4. Sunday, 11 to 1 and 2 to 4. Mm -hmm. I would door knock the whole street and invite them. This is before I met Mike. Um, and, the, and the successful agents definitely took advantage of me because they were like, they would give me leads and I'd give them 70%. I was making nothing. So after my split with my brokerage, I was making nothing. I didn't care though, to be honest. I just wanted to be busy and I just wanted to close deals. And I knew that I'd get better. Um, and I did pretty good at open houses. So the majority of my business came from open houses and uh, and leads that were given to me from top producing agents, if that makes sense. So where where, where did you, since you didn't have Mike Ferry, <laughs> It didn't seem like you had any type of real structure, but you had it built in with, within you. Yeah. What gave you the idea to even want to door knock and to hold multiple open houses a weekend? Like where, where did that come from? Your broker that come from online self-education? The open houses was me. I mean, I just thought, why not do four? Like what else am I doing? <laughs> I had nothing else to do. So I'm like, why not? And I figured it was Toronto and back then the market was hot and everybody was competing for the same time slot. So I figured why not do change it up and do 11 to one and see what happens at that time slot. Cause everybody was cramming to get into the same house, like into houses at the same time frame. So I, I, I think that was just me, but then I was pretty much broke and I was introduced to a mortgage broker at the time from CIBC in Toronto who sponsored Mike Ferry. So that, that bank used to sponsor MFO to come to Canada. And this guy's like, Hey, I've got a ticket to go see Mike Ferry. Do you want to go? I'm like, who's that? And he's like, oh, he's a real estate coach from the U.S. I'm like, uh, never heard of him, but is it free? <laughs> he's like, yeah, it's free. I'm like, all right, let's go, man. If it's free, let me do it. So I, I went uh, because I was paid to go. And um, I signed up for, I, it was Mike himself. And I signed up for coaching that day, man. I used my line of credit. It was, I paid the thousand bucks a month back then, the 12K. And uh, I never looked back. Been in coaching ever since. Wow. Yeah. So what, what would you say, DK? What was like the when you when 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 you got with with Mike? What took you from that like three hundred thousand dollars a year to over a million? Like, what would you say is like that one thing that like that if you just kept doing was it you know discipline? Was it just like overall the like experience of like you know your your new market? Like, what was it about in your in in your mind? It's a good question. I think had I, had I stayed in Toronto, I still would have made, you know, I would have made it, but it would have taken longer because I didn't know as many people, but I, I had the grit and the determination. I still would have been a fine, but uh, I didn't have the luxury of waiting. So I had to make more money faster. So um, I think a lot of people, I see mistakes in the sense that I see a lot of people have a decent year and then they build a team immediately. And I, I don't necessarily think that's the right way to do it. I think that my coach told me, this is just, this. there's no right or wrong way to run a team. You do whatever you want for anybody listening out there. It's what makes you happy. But the way I was taught was, you don't need any help until you do 50 deals. So I didn't know any better. So I'm like, okay, I didn't know shit, right? So I'm like, okay. So she's like, when you do your 50th transaction, you can hire your admin. I'm like, okay. 50th transaction, I called my coach. Can I hire an admin now? I'm dying. She's like, yeah, because I was working like seven days a week, right? And then... When I hired my admin, I jumped to like 75 and then I went to a hundred. So when I got to a hundred, I kept saying, when can I hire a buyer's agent or a showing agent? Like I'm drowning. And she said, not till you do a hundred deals because you need to have 20 to 25 active listings at any given time in order to feed leads to your buyer's agent. Otherwise, what are they going to do for you? She's like, they're not going to prospect. Otherwise they'll be on their own. So this is the things I was taught. So I just did that. So on my hundredth deal, I hired my first agent. So to answer your question in a very long winded way, 
I think what I did was I was very organized as a solo agent. I set up a lot of good systems and I trained my admin on the way I like things being done. And then as I scaled, she was then able to take what I taught her and teach the first agent that I acquired. And then it was just like, you know, carbon copy, right? Like as we got busier, we did more transactions, like over 150 deals, 200 deals. It was easy because the systems were already in place. Whereas a lot of people hired the agents and they're still a shit show. They still work seven days a week. Like I'll give you an example. Just today, I called a guy because he sent me a Christmas card. Really nice agent too. Great guy, friend of mine. Met him through Mike Ferry. And I just called him to say, thanks for sending me the Christmas card. How are you doing? He's like, oh, you know, man, I was all right. I was working all weekend. I go, why are you working on the weekend? He's like, well, we're real estate agents. You have to work on the weekends. I'm like, mm, no, you don't. I haven't worked a Saturday or a Sunday in years. But I was him. I was him. I was scared shitless not to work Saturday, Sunday. I remember my coach saying to me, you have to take Sundays off. And I'm like, no, like no, impossible. And she's like, you have to, you're going to burn out. And she was right. I did. So I took Sundays off and then we gravitated to every second Saturday, not working past noon. And then it was no Saturday. So I haven't worked a Saturday in three years, but these are the things that you learn as you go, that as you delegate and have surround yourself with good people, you can, you need to let go because when you let go and you hire good people around you, you realize you don't have to do it all. It's more fun with, with company, first of all, and you actually end up being making more money and being more profitable as long as you surround yourself with the right people and you take the time to do the self-care like you know what we talked about before where I just transformed my body and my mind a couple of years ago uh focusing on me well I mean that is a very detailed answer and I do appreciate uh you breaking it down because I think a lot of agents out here that's exactly what they think right it's it's not just a real estate coach maybe telling them they have to but it's everybody else, right? It's even the potential client, like, oh, like you work for me. I want to see this house at 11 a.m. Where you work for me, I want to, I want to do the listening presentation at 7 p.m. on a Saturday night. Yeah. But you, you broke through that barrier. So, what, what would you say your schedule looked like from a busy agent, right, to where you were just getting into the business, to then where you were able to start that scale that you were talking about? And then where it took you off, like walk us through like your, your daily schedule, what it looked like. Yeah. The, so the year I started, I wasn't working hard. I thought I was, I wasn't, I mean, I was working like, yeah, I wasn't even prospecting to be honest. Like that first year when I made the uh, 80 grand, um, when I met Mike Ferry, I was working seven days a week. I'm not going to lie. My kid was in diapers. So I sat my wife down. We had a deal. It was like, look, I can't breastfeed as far as I know. <laughs> I never tried it. Like, you know, I'm also Greek, so we're a bit traditional. And my wife is too. And I said, you want me to stay home and change diapers and stuff? I'll do it, but I can't make a million bucks. Like, I don't believe in balance. You, you, I can't be the best father and the best real estate agent and the best husband. And like, something will suffer because I'll, my time is spent over here. So we had a deal. The first two, three years when they're in diapers and they need mom, you take care of that and I will crush it over here. And as the boys get older then, you know, I'll spend more time with them. And that was the, deal. we had a deal, we had a pact and she was okay with it. And I was, I think I'm lucky because my wife grew up in a, in a, uh, a family that had their own business too. Cause I know a lot of other guys that had wives that are like, no, you got to be home at four every night for dinner. You got to be home every night to change diapers. That's fine. My best friend, we had a talk the other day and he said, you know, you made sacrifices early on. He goes, I chose to be home with my kids the first three, four years. And he goes, cause I wanted to we're not, neither of us is right or wrong. You know, he's in the high tech sector. I just knew in the first five years, most agents fail. So I knew that I had to give it my everything. I'm in my late twenties. What else, what do I like? That's my job is to make money for my family and provide. That's just the way I was raised. So I worked seven days a week, guys, seven days a week, 15, 16, 17 hours a day, no joke. And yeah, it worked. Went from like 300 to 700 went to about a million with just me and uh, one agent and one admin. And then from that point, it was hiring more salespeople. Um, I pretty much always run with three salespeople, myself and one admin. Just recently, um, I've scaled up to four realtors, two admin, because we hit 240 transactions with one admin. I, I literally think she was going to kill me. 
it was too much work for one person and I pay my staff extremely well, but I, you know, we get a lot of utility out of each person, but there's a point where it's like, you need to take care of your people and, and, you know, for vacations and stuff like that and sick days. So we're much more uh, efficient now with two full-time admins and then more salespeople because I do a lot of traveling and, uh, and I wanted to have, make sure we have enough people on the ground. So mm. Yeah. So my schedule then was seven days a week. And in the last four years, it's been five days a week. Very, very strict. Very. In other words, I try to go on three listing appointments a day. Does it always happen? No, especially lately when the market has you know, fallen a bit. Um, but it was scheduled for 11, one and three. And in 2021, it was going on three a day, 11, one and three. So I could be home for five for dinner. Whereas the first few, like the middle years, rather, it was one, three and five. Get it? So I'd be home for 7.38. Kids are asleep. It was a shit show. And my kids started saying, Dad, you're never home. And then my mom said to me, I liked you better when you were poor. And yeah. I'm like, Mom, why would you say that? She's like, you never go to church anymore. You don't. You, you always work every day. So that's when I stopped working the Saturday and Sunday thing. And that's when I made a conscious decision to take care of my family and to like, in a sense of taking care of myself health-wise. So I could be better for my family and for my customers and for my you know community and stuff like that. What did uh, DK? What did you have to learn or unlearn in order for you to, um, I guess maybe if like how you were able to transition from seven days of the week being that unhealthy, let's say quote unquote lifestyle, to then but being a high producer to yeah. then having that structure to like saying like that like it was it a confidence thing was it just like oh, I'm DK, I can figure this out? Or was it like, did you learn a new skill? Like, what was that like in terms of that transition, getting to that nice tight schedule that you have now? So I was very driven by things, right? So like I had a vision of having a, a, a nice car, an Audi R8, and I had it on my vision board and it was like all about me getting that car. And then the cool thing is on the way to achieving that car, which I did end up getting, I ended up paying off debt and, you know, buying, like taking care of my family and stuff. But then when I got the car, I was like, so empty. And uh, I was literally like, you're talking about me that I, I wanted this car for 10 years. I sold it six months later because I was so empty inside. Now, granted, the pandemic hit, just bought the car. So my wife's like, go for a drive. I'm like, where? The whole world is shut down. I feel like an asshole driving around in a $200,000 car. A lot of my friends are financially hurting. And here I am driving around in this sports car. Where am I going? Like, it's stupid. I couldn't even go anywhere. So mm -hmm. I'm like, what am I doing? And then I'm like, will I ever sell a house again? It was before the market spiked. Like, it was right at the beginning of COVID. So I sold the fucking car. I sold it. And um, because I also looked in the mirror and I'm like, oh, my God, what the hell, man? I was like puffy. Like, if you've seen pictures of me, you guys know me for a little bit, but I looked just bloated. I was not well rested. Like, I'd sleep and I felt like I hadn't slept at all. Um, grinding my teeth at night. I actually had one of my back teeth break in, in my sleep because it's the strongest tooth in your mouth. I guess I was grinding. So I guess my stress was manifesting its way into my body in other ways that I, I didn't realize. Here I am thinking I'm Superman and nothing can take me down. Well, you know, we're all human. We all have our breaking point. So I do tend to put a lot on my shoulders, right? So um, yeah, so it was a lot. It was It was just me taking a look at why am I doing this? I literally sat down and said, okay, I've got every award you can think of on the wall. I've got no debt, um, at least no bad debt. Like I've got rental properties, but you know what I mean? Like I'm not hurting in, in for debt. Again, so why, why am I unhappy? Like, why am I not able to enjoy? I'd be home and let's say I did have a day off and I could not turn off my mind. My phone was always in my hand. I couldn't play basketball, which I love. Even if I was with my kids, I had my phone in my hand. It was a shit show. Like I wasn't able to enjoy myself. I couldn't turn off. So that was it. It was a breaking point. And it took, it took a few times for my boys to be like, dad, are you going to be on your phone today? Or are you going to hang out? And because I realized my kids don't give a shit how many houses I sell or how many sports cars I have. They just want to play basketball, hang out, go see an Avengers movie. You know, they're, they're 12 and 14. So even when I bought the R8, they didn't give a shit. They're like, okay, cool. Like it's only a two seater though. How are you going to take us for ice cream? There's two of us. Mm -hmm. it, it's cool how a kid thinks right i'm like my, my my youngest goes and he was like eight at the time he goes you should have bought a 911 there's back seats <laughs> so so that was the breaking point and um 
that was definitely the breaking point. Yeah. So when, when your mom told you that she liked you better when you were poor, and then you're starting to have these new revelations, if you've, if you've achieved these goals, and like you said, you looked at yourself, you're puffy, and you, you know your health is not in check. What, and I know it was a breaking point, but like, what was actually like really going through your head, like in terms of where like, all right, now I need to take control of myself, my self-awareness, my health, right? Like, yeah. what, what was that? What, what, what did that look like mentally? And when you did take control of that, of, of that unstable, you know, that, that mental, un, you know, uh, you know, the mental health, the unhealthiness inside, like when you did take control over that, what did that look like? for you as a, as a human, for your family? And then what did that do for your business? So I, I'm the kind of person that would say yes to everybody, e everybody. Like I didn't want to let anybody down. Um, so I realized I had to start saying no to some people. I actually start, I say no more than I say yes to most things now because I was out of integrity because I'd say yes to everybody and everything. And then I would do it all in a, in a mediocre way. So I was out of integrity. And I'm like, why do I keep saying yes to everybody when I know I'm burnt out? I know I need sleep. I know I can't do all this, but I didn't want to say no to anybody or anything or any opportunity. Like you said, guy calls you, hey, I can only meet tonight. I've already met three other realtors, but I just got your name. Can you come in an hour? Yep, no problem. You know, sorry, can't make dinner. Sorry, you can't make that play. Sorry, I can't go to church or whatever. So like, I, it, it, I just, I guess I just came to the realization that um, if I don't start taking care of myself, I'm not good for anybody, for my mom, for my wife, my kids, even my customers and my team. And, um, I think I was very transactional. I was doing a lot of deals. And as Mike Ferry says, you can succeed in making, uh, a sale, but fail in making a client. And I think that our service was okay to get the job done, but like, it wasn't that great afterwards. Like we didn't, really take nurture our database too well. Like, so I, I just didn't like where it was going. You know, I, I take pride in being good at what I do, but I take a lot of pride also in making sure people are happy with what I do. So um, for example, we have this clipboard on my wall here that said this many deals before we go to Las Vegas. And like every year I have a team goal where if the team did a certain number of trends in every meeting, I'd rip off how many deals we did. And one day I'm like, why am I doing this? Like the deals are going to happen at this point. Now, like now, whereas now I reward my team for like how many Google reviews they get. It's based on service, not based on deals because the deals will happen. There's this state, okay, when you're a top producing agent, right? There's this cycle where let's say you crack a hundred deals. And then if you're like me, you're like, shit, was that a mistake? You start getting like, you think you're a fraud and you're like, can I do it again? Did I get lucky? Was it the market? And then you do it again. And you're like, shit, okay, I did it twice, but can I do it again? That was literally me for like seven years. Like every January, I'm like, fuck, can I do it again? And finally, after 10 years, I'm like, okay, I can do it again. It's been 10 years consistently, 100 deals a year. I'm not going back. Like I am actually good at this. You know what I mean? It's not imposter syndrome anymore. So I think realizing it's maturity, realizing that I am good at this. It's not luck. Um, we do offer a good level of service and a good product. And um I think it was just realizing that. So it allowed me to breathe and be like, okay, stop chasing the next deal. Instead, attract it by putting out good service and putting out a good vibe so that it comes to me instead of me chasing it. Now, I still prospect, but I don't prospect with the intention of getting an appointment and getting a sale. I prospect with the intention of how can I help this person? How can I help this person achieve their goal and make them so happy that they go and tell three people about me? Get it? Whereas before it was like, I got to close this fast, get paid, move on. Because that was my retail mindset, right? So I made that transition to taking care of them. So they tell everyone they know. And it started working. Like every transaction turned into three. We'd literally get two or three referrals per deal. And that's why I was able to do so many deals with just two people. Like me and two other salespeople did 230 ends. Can't do that unless you give good service and have really, really good systems. And, D and DK, for all those deals that, and like where you're at, that's where, and this is where I'm assuming that you're at today, correct? The 230 no. or so? No, we, we did that two years ago when the, at the peak. Okay. Last year we were down, just okay. like most agents. Um, and this year we're probably going to end up at like 140. We're way down. Okay. Two years ago. Most people are. Um, our average price is way up. So GCI is still very high, but 
No, like we're not, I mean, I don't know anybody that's doing the same amount of transactions that they were in 2021. It was just a stupid year. It yeah, was, for sure. It was but I guess what I, I, I guess the point of what I'm trying to make is like, basically it seems like, was there, was there a direct correlation to your getting your health and fitness in check to yeah. then this, this like, okay, we're not going to track how many deals we're going to go Google review. We're going to go and do more servicing. Was that around the same time that all this was happening, you personally, or was that a separate and like a separate time? What happened was the best year of my career, 2.7 million to me. That's the year I, I looked in my mirror. I was like, you're fat as hell. Like, what the hell? You know, you look like fat bastard. Great. You have all this money, but what are you going to do with it? And, and then I said, okay, I can't do it again. Literally at the end of December, I was like, I can't do this again. I'm either going to like gain another 20 pounds or... You know, I wasn't having heart pain, but I'm like, will I have a heart attack? I don't know. You hear of a lot of people having heart attacks in their early 40s. Mm -hmm. So I said, the only way I can possibly do 200 transactions again is if I go through a radical physical change and mental change. Otherwise, either mentally or physically, I will not make it. I knew that because it destroyed me. It destroyed my team. We were exhausted. You know, like it, it was very financially rewarding but the quality of life really sucked. So I knew that in order for me to duplicate that, I had to become something different. I had to become, you know, somebody who looks like a guy who does 500 deals in order to get to that level and maintain that level. So we will get back to 240 deals again, because, you know, my maximum capacity was a hundred transactions for years. I feel like I could do 150 now because I'm stronger. I have more energy. You know, I, I mean, uh, I'm in the best shape of my life uh, by far. I just had blood work done. Thank God. I've got the resting heart rate of like Lance Armstrong. Like I'm 43 and my heart rate's like that of a 25 year old. So, but I've worked my ass off to get here. And I, I only did it to manage stress, to take care of myself and to ensure that when the next market swing comes, because this is the calm before the storm, I truly feel that mm -hmm. my body and my mind are ready to accept that business. I, because I, I can't go back to who I was because that guy can't do it again. He can't for sure. And when did you start that journey? Two years ago? Two years ago. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Two years ago, just started uh, waking up at four at the gym for, well, they open at five, so I have no choice. So I, I wake up at four, I'll have my, uh, I'll have a celery juice, uh, kick the metabolism in and uh, sounds gross, but it's actually not bad. And then uh, write out my gratitudes for the day. I'm at the gym the second they open. The, the workouts are long. They're about two hours a day, uh, two hours uh, every single day. Well, six days a week. And then I'm home for like 7.30-ish. I see the boys before they go off to school. And then I'm at the office for like 8.45. And then I, you know, hit the phones from like 9 to 12. I'll typically eat at my desk. I have a standing desk. I haven't sat in like eight years. I haven't had a chair in eight years. Um, and then I'll typically, you know, eat and work from my desk. I'll, I'll flip on YouTube once in a while to look at a car I can't afford or to look at some comedy or stuff. music videos. Like I do a lot of mindset breaks to stay positive. And, uh, I'm typically home now for like six, six thirty, the latest, which is pretty good. You know? Okay. A, yeah. what, what's this all, how, how did you get to that step? Like, was it books that you're reading? Were you looking at a lot of YouTube? Did you hire a fitness coach? Did you hire a trainer at the gym? Like wh wh where was that change to for you to go from, uh, you know, X weight to, to the current weight that you're at to be the best shape of your life? I stopped reading books on sales. I'm not going to say that I'm the best salesperson in the world. I definitely like, you know, you can always get better. However, I read so many books on sales, human behavior, the way the mind works, personality styles. I was obsessed, like hundreds of books. And then I'm like, okay, but it, this is not going to get me to three, four, 500 deals. What's going to get me there is being a better leader. So I transitioned my time from working on becoming the best salesperson I can be to the best leader I can be. Because I realized I needed a lot of work in that department. I'm, a, I'm expressive, but I'm a driver under uh, pressure. So if you're in my office environment, you know, because my schedule is so tight, I'll often be very quick with my responses. You might think, oh, this guy's like really a driver. I'm really not. I'm just super efficient. So I realized that even though my intentions were good, maybe to my team member that was amiable or analytical, they thought I was aggressive. 
And really, I, I didn't try to be aggressive, but that's how I was perceived. So mm -hmm. I, had to, I had to work on that. So I took success coaching. It's a program through Tony Robbins in order to become a better leader. I read tons of books on leadership. I'd read books, autobiographies from CEOs that I admired to try and pick up little things here and there. And then I hired the best physical wellness coach I could find in the business, uh, who's trained a lot of my fairy people, actually. His name's Chris DeVecchio. And he taught me how to sleep, how to eat, how to work out, you know, and uh, how to balance all of that with travel, which is very tricky for a Greek <laughs> going to Greece. But not just that, like, you know, when you have little kids, you go to Disneyland, like, what are you going to do? Like, it's all junk food everywhere. Sorry, mommy, you Americans, you eat like shit. Like there's it's cheap food everywhere. So like, it's really hard to find healthy food when you're on vacation sometimes, at least not if your brain is trained to look for it, you know, you'll look for the burgers and fries. So I, I had to learn, I had to unlearn how I did everything and relearn how to eat and sleep and all that kind of stuff. Still have the same trainer now. And, um, I still work with a lot of, uh, I still, I'll try and surround myself with leaders that I admire. So like I'll pull them aside and ask them about how they run their team, how they run their business. I'll go and shadow people that have bigger teams than me and I'll just pick their brains, especially if they have good retention. You know, I'm really uh, obsessed with retention. Um, it's very expensive hiring the wrong person. Very, very, so, yeah. Time, money, all that stuff. Right. So yeah, man. Um, I'm definitely not the smartest guy in the room and I know that. So I seek out the answers from other people that are smarter than me in those mm -hmm. areas. So what do you think DK that you need to do? You have four, you have four realtors right now, two yeah. admin, right? One is pregnant with twins. So I'll be down to one in March. Okay. Well, that's good. I mean, you know, doing 140 deals as opposed to 240, you're not putting like the pressure on them. So, yeah. um, so leadership, what other, what other skill sets right now do you feel like you need to like, learn in order for you to get to when the market starts to do this again to get to 400 500 deals like skill set for you to start to is it more of a recruiting mindset is it more of a of, of an attraction mindset like what what do you feel like or or is it like you said retention like what do you feel like is the one skill that you really want to like uh that you need to do in order for you to kind of get to that next level for yourself Good question. I think we have the right people. I, I know we have enough people to get to 250 deals with the people that we have. My acquisition, my latest acquisition as a realtor has been in the business for 16 years. She's in her late fifties. She's amazing. She's good for 15, 20 deals a year. She just wanted to be on a team because she was alone, like lonely. And mm -hmm. that was a very smart hire for me because she knows what she's doing already. You know, she's very amiable. Um, she brings a sense of maturity to my team that maybe we lack in, in a sense of uh, experience because I've only been doing this for 11 years, right? She's longer than me. Um, that was key because when I travel, so when I traveled in 2022, we still did well, like the business still ran decent. Uh, but this year, you know, it didn't go so well. When I was gone, I was gone for a month in the summer, only two listing appointments. Typically, we'll have 10 to 15 a month, only two. So I'm like, okay, I, this is not a business. If I can't leave, yeah. I, have, I haven't created a business. I was able to for a few years there, but then recently I noticed things fell off. So I, I said, okay, I need to empower my team to be able to go on listing appointments. You've got two methods of thought here. You teach your team to go on listing appointments. If they get good enough, they'll leave you. So you're training your competition or the other mindset, empower people, create an environment that's so uplifting and rewarding and loving and you know uh, embraces people that they won't want to go anywhere. So I choose... training my competition, but you can't do that. So I was cherry picking my buyers, you know, I'm being straight with you guys. Like I'm being vulnerable, but like I was like, it's, it's not nice, but I was doing it. Now it's like, no, I give it all away. Like, you know, very rare that I work with a buyer, very rare. It's gotta be family friend. It's gotta be a very close referral that says, I only want to work with you. But for the most part, I give it all away. So mm -hmm. I go on more listing appointments because the more listing appointments I go on, the better. And that, and I've also transitioned to teaching my team listings. 
Because if they only do buys, we're not going to get to 250. It's not going to happen. They have to go on listing appointments too, and they have to prospect too. So that's what do you okay? So on that on that side of it, then what do you what are you training them on? Like, I mean, what do you feel like is the first thing that they need to learn on the listing side for you to feel comfortable traveling and doing whatever you want to do and making that transition? They've got to be able to pre-qualify uh, okay. better. Uh, I think By the way, even in this market, DK, are you sure with the lack of inventory that we have in, in, trans in transactions? Just want to be clear about that. <laughs> so to be clear, in Ottawa, Canada, we have an abundance of inventory. Uh, but oh. to be honest with you, the inventory that's out for the majority is overpriced and crap. So like a good house that's priced well, even in our market, is selling pretty quickly. But the inventory has risen significantly. Like there's a shitload of inventory out there, but a lot of it's overpriced or not, doesn't look great or whatever. Because think about it, a lot of the realtors I'm dealing with got their license in the last two, three years. They don't know how to price property. They don't know how to, mm. you know, they got they got their license when everything was selling. So we're going through a transition right now. Mm. I actually think that a lot of those guys are going to get washed away and they're going to get back to business where things are priced right. So I need to teach my team how to pre-qualify better and how to present with a script based presentation, not just winging it. So we work a lot on that. We work a lot on pre-qualifying. I listen to their role plays. I listen to their uh, calls and we critique them. Course correct. You know, um, I give a lot of praise for the right behaviors instead of the right results. If you, if you reward behavior, you'll actually get more out of your team than rewarding the results because it's the behavior that you want. You want them to come into the office. You want them to come in and prospect. If you're only rewarding them when they get a listing appointment, they're not going to be as motivated to do the behavior. So that was another shift in my mindset. Stop rewarding. Reward the, the result as well, of course. Ring the bell, celebrate, all that stuff. But you got to reward the behavior because mm -hmm. they're not going to be as strong as me. Like if I go on, my closing ratio is 89%. So if they go on an appointment, their closing ratio is probably going to be 60, 70%. I'm trying to get them to like 80, you know, and that's the key. How do you get them up higher? One of my agents, their closing ratio is probably 40%, but that's okay. You know, we have somewhere to grow and, and learn. And if they're only going on one appointment every six months, how are they going to get better? Mm. I'm just trying to get them to go on as many appointments as possible. So you're are keeping you this operation lean in. Oh, sorry, Rich, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, so you're keeping this operation lean and mean enough for the, for the agents to really like get to the next level and make that transition for themselves as you're growing over time, right? Like, it's not like you're like overspending on Zillow or realtor.com. Oh, you don't know I mean have Zillow up there. I don't think so. Right. Or like realtor.com, these other things up there, but it's like, what that that's what I'm hearing because I think the biggest also shift that I've heard from other team leaders has been that they, they can't afford to, to train their, their, their team on listings because the money is just, if they lose a listing on that opportunity and if they don't go on it themselves, this is what I'm being, I'm hear, hearing from other M MFO people. Yeah. That's what, that's what they were saying to me. So what so, do you, what's your I, advice? Number one, I don't spend a dollar. I don't buy leads. I never have and never will. Yeah. Never will. Maybe I will, but I doubt it. Like I, I anyways, I have a whole thought process on buying leads. I know it's a big thing in the U S but I'm not, I'm not a big proponent of the doing it here. Um, I ain't giving my listing appointments to them unless I go to Greece or I'm gone for a month. Those are mine. They have to find their own. So I'm not, I'm already giving them my buyers. Why would I give them my listings? I've worked my whole life to build this database. So no, no, no. I'm not giving them my listing appointments because I'm still in high production. I'm going to be 44 in March. I see myself still doing this at least till I'm 50, at least because it's profitable. I like the money mm -hmm. and I, I like what I do now as I scale back. Yes. I'll give away you know, more and more and more, maybe take a lesser cut, still make a decent living and never be here. But for the next foreseeable future, God willing, I can do it. I'm doing it, you know, until uh, I can take it as far as I can go. But they ain't taking mine. Hell no. If somebody calls in on a sign call, whatever, if I'm here, it's mine. If I'm not here, then it goes to them. Okay. They have to go find their own. But that's the thing. I'm teaching them how to find their own. I'm not leaving them out there stranded. Like I can give them a fish or I can teach them how to fish, right? And a good leader, as much as everybody wants leads, they don't even know what the hell they'd do with them if they had them. And most mm -hmm. teams I talk to, those team leads buy leads and all this. And they, they're buyer's agents or whatever you want to call them. They have like four, five, 600 leads. Like 
I have like six right now. Like any good agent has less than 10 good leads at any given time. Then they get buried in leads and they don't even know which ones are the good ones and which ones are the, are the crappy ones. So I don't believe in giving endless leads to agents because they just don't know what to do with them. They get overwhelmed. A hundred percent do get overwhelmed and they, you know, misconstrue what buckets, you know, it was an A person with a B person, a C person. So they treat everybody the same. And then yep. when they, when they're in overdrive and there's too much they have to do, they seem to sh shut down and they don't do anything. So all those opportunities go, go by the wayside. So I totally, yeah. uh, I, to I totally get that philosophy. So would you say that, you know, in terms of the leadership style that you, when you give them a buyer, do you role play with them? Do you, or do you just expect them to know the script? Like, like what are you doing with that? So you, you're confident that if you gave them a million dollar buyer, or even, even if it's a $200,000 buyer, you gave them somebody that came through your preferred network that you know needs white glove service or Raven fan service. How do you know that they know what to say and what to do? So number one, I'm obsessed with personality matching. So I will assess who on my team is the best fit for that person. Because I have an AB, I have an amiable, I have a driver, I have an analytical, and I have an expressive by design. Mm -hmm. Right. So by design, I've got different personality styles working for me, with me rather. So I will first assess who's the best fit, and I'm very good at that. I um, I spend a lot of time getting good at that, and to be honest, that was what took me from 300 to a million was getting more versatile because I was only working with people like me. Now I'm pretty good at like adapting to to environments. It exhausts. Me. It exhausts me talking to an analytical, but I'll do it. And I'm good at it now, but after I'm done, I'm like, holy shit. I feel like I went 12 rounds with Mike Tyson. Mm -hmm. uh, but to answer your question, first I'll match them up. Then they have to do a buyer consultation at the office. So I'm there. And I'm only there for five minutes. I, I come in, I introduce myself. I shake hands. I express how they're in very good hands. And then I'm gone. And... At first, before they get the clients, we'll do role plays. After the role plays, I will sit in on a full consultation and they last for typically 45 minutes. After a few full consultations, I feel comfortable and confident they don't need me there and they feel comfortable they don't need me there. Then I'll just come in and shake hands for five minutes. And the handshake thing for five minutes is not just for them. What if this agent leaves me? I want that client knowing that at the end of the day, I'm here, you know, and, and they can always come to me. I don't want to lose that client. But I also feel like I'm old school. So I go to Giovanni's Italian restaurant here in Ottawa. It's like run by these Italian guys and my favorite restaurant, right? And you walk in, you feel like you're in a scene from like Goodfellas. And as soon as I walk in, I am not the richest guy to walk into that restaurant. You can tell just by the cars in the parking lot and stuff, right? But I walk in and the owner, Nino, comes around Agent DK is here. DK, how you doing? How's the family? Shakes my hand. Oh, beautiful watch you got there. How's it going? How's business? Get it? Like, that's all he does. And he knows not cooking the food. He's not serving me. He shakes my hand. And then they'll sit me down. And then during the meal, Nino comes by. Everything okay? Everything good? Let me know, eh? Walks away. I'm good. I feel special. And that's what I want the clients to feel. I want them to feel special. Mike Ferry says, MMFI, make me feel important. Why do I go to Giovanni's? I can eat pasta at home for $10, but I go to fucking Giovanni's and I pay 60. Why? Because mm -hmm. I, want, I want to feel special. And Nino makes me feel special. So I maybe because my family was in the restaurant business, I feel like when someone comes into my office, you have to treat them like, first of all, with respect, because they're putting food on our table and they have a million choices out there. And I truly believe that. So I want to thank them for even considering us, let alone working with us. Second of all, I want to shake their hand and say, thank you for your business. In the event that Andrea or Nala or, you know, Kim or, or Danny is not available, I'm here. Call the office. I'm always here. When you find the house that you like, I'm there negotiating with my team. If you want me to go look at the house, give you a second opinion, no problem. They never do because by then they've struck a really good relationship with my team. But get it? They, get, they, they, they feel that sense of, okay, this is, this is like a family-run, highly efficient, well-oiled machine. And that's the impression that I want every single client leaving this office being like, holy shit, these guys are good. So that's what I do to ensure that the quality meets my standards. And then we use a CRM and in the CRM, email, text, phone, notes is all in one profile. So I can go into any profile at any given time and get an update on what's happening. 
we didn't have that five years ago. We have we, we invested in, in a very good CRM with systems in place, with drip campaigns, things like that. So, you know, you make that transition from being a realtor to a broker to a business person. And it is a transition. And, I, and now I'm at that business person, you know, level. That's, That's awesome. That's deep. And and I really appreciate you open up the books to to share because a lot a lot of people, like you said, in the very beginning, they go from being a, an independent agent all the way to trying to be the broker owner, right? And they forget everything else in between. But you have to have that natural pro project uh, projected every single year after year. And then you have to have the naturalness of learning how to manage, learning how to be better, learning all these different facets, right? Of personality yeah. styles, of leadership styles, of everything in between. So it sounds like you've done a great job uh, doing it. And I know I know a lot of people that I know look up to you as well and know yeah, that you can. And I hear your name hand over hand, no matter, no matter what events we are, even if we're at, our own company events, I hear your name, you're brought up. So you definitely impacted uh, a lot of people that um, around. And there's a lot of things I learned today and a lot of things I've learned, you know, from you over the years and, you know, not, not even knowing, like, you know, I remember when I was year one in the business, well, I'm sorry, year one in Mike Ferry, Mike Ferry was calling your name. And I remember I just went up, just had the, had the audacity to talk to you. You were kind enough to talk. And we had a long conversation, gave me a couple of nuggets. You had no idea who I was. Nobody had no idea, but you know, it's, it's stuck here, you know? And then over time it, uh, it worked well. So thank you for that too. Yeah. And yeah, DK, how can everyone find you? And like, if they have like a referral or they have any questions about um, your area over there. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for your kind words. Your check is in the mail. Um, you <laughs> can reach out. So I, I like Instagram. Agent DK is my handle. You can go to my website, agentdk.com, if you want to set up a Zoom call or a coaching session. I'm not really a coach, but I, I have had sessions where I've helped people. Like, let's say they just need a kick in the ass or they're having a mindset. I'm pretty good at turning people's mindsets around very quickly when they're in a rut. And I think it's because I've done it myself so many fucking times. I've been in so many ruts myself that I now know how to get out of them. So that's my favorite thing in the world is like giving someone that um, skill set to be able to, and all it is is showing them to be grateful for what they got. That's all it is because they forget. They just focus on what they don't have. And it's like, slow it down. Like, hold up. What do you drive? What do you wear? Where are you? What You're healthy, right? Like, sorry, what's going on? And they're like, oh shit. Yeah. So like, it's not hard. It all stems from gratitude. So I would say reach out to me on Instagram. Um, Agent DK, or go to my website, agentdk.com. One thing I'm going to tell you guys, I want to leave you with this. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of fake it till you make it. And we live in a fake it world. I can't tell you how many people I know that buy Instagram followers. Shit, mm. I bought I bought some. I bought like 5,000 years ago because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know. Like I had like 1,000 and someone's like, you want to buy some? I'm like, okay, it was 100 bucks. <laughs> That's funny. And, I, and I know a lot of people that have bought hundreds of thousands, but they, they're full of shit. They're full of shit. Fake it till you make it. But people see that and the perception is, oh my God, this person is Insta famous. They must be really good. Or I got to connect with this person or whatever. So I just find it so hard to figure out who's full of shit and who isn't in this world. But I'm going to tell you one thing. You can't fake it in this business because even if you fake it till you make it, once you get, if you're, if you're lucky enough to get a contract signed and you don't know what you're doing, you're going to either go broke trying to sell that property, get stressed out, ruin your reputation. There is no shortcut. To success in real estate. I haven't met anybody. I have seen people go bang because they bought leads or bought followers or whatever, or went and bought a car because daddy has money or whatever. But like, they don't last. They never last. I have never, and I've only been doing this for 11 years, but I have yet to see anybody who was like a rocket at the gate that had lasting power. Mm. And I remember when Karen Bernardi, who's made like 50 million bucks in her career, She's older than us, right? But nice lady from Colorado. And she said to me, she goes, everybody makes a million bucks now. She goes, I was doing it 25 years ago. And she's right. A couple of buyer's agents, a couple of admin, million bucks. But what are they keeping? 10 bucks? Like, you know what I mean? Like, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of bullshit out there. You can't, for anybody listening to this, it takes three to five years to develop sales skills. Three to five years. And then you just start to get good. Right. That's when you can crack like a hundred deals, three to five years. If you really put, put in the work, 
And then you make, you take the next five to 10 years, you know, mastering that craft. It takes 10 years for mastery. They say, well, I've got 11 years. I can tell you, I ain't no master. I've got it down, but I've got a lot to learn. But one thing I've learned, you cannot fake it. So oh, wow. you got to put in the time and the effort because people will call you out. People aren't stupid and they'll know you don't know what the fuck you're talking about if you get in front of them. Rich, before I just remembered my final question that I have in every podcast. Oh, you ready yeah. for this? I got yeah. it. Okay. No, so, DK, we're going to go back into a time machine. Picture yourself in a time machine. You're going back to your 22, 23 year old self. Okay. And you can, you get, you can share only one thing to yourself going back at that age. What would you tell yourself about anything, life, business, uh, dreams, anything back then, knowing what you know now? 23? Early 20s, mid 20s, yeah. Yeah, 23 was my favorite year because I'm a big Michael Jordan fan. So I was like, oh man, the year of 23, you know, something good's gonna happen. <laughs> I used to be a worrier because I wasn't sure, you know, when we were broke, like I wasn't sure if I'd make the bill payments and stuff like that. So I don't know, man. In one way, I'm like, did all that worrying make me who I am? But if it's one thing I could probably tell myself was everything's going to be okay. I wouldn't tell myself why or how. I would just say, relax. Like, try and enjoy the journey a bit more. Don't be so stressed out. Relax. Everything's going to be fine. Because there's no way in hell I ever thought I'd be where I am now. And let me be clear, I'm down, right? We talked about that at the beginning of this podcast. Mm -hmm. But my down is someone else's dream. See what I'm saying? Gratitude. Yeah, I'm down. From a stupid... Yeah number that never should have happened because of a global pandemic. So I, I can't take the credit for a hot market and I won't take the blame for a shitty market. I can't do that. We shouldn't. We do all the time because we have egos, but it's not my, I'm not a superhero because I had that great year and I'm not a shithead for having a, a not so good year. It's, it's, there's only so much we can do in the confines of the market that we have. So I guess what I would have told myself was chill. Everything's going to be fine and enjoy the process a little more. You know, live in the moment a little more. Because I'm 44 in March. I'm like, holy crap. That happened fast, bro. <laughs> so just trying to enjoy the moment a bit more and chill. Everything's going to be fine. Nice. Thank you, DK. Awesome. <laughs>